helping countries to help themselves, what do they need? An interview with German Development Minister Dirk Niebel. Dirk Niebel, Germany is, after the US, the world's second biggest donor of development aid, according to the OECD. Last year, our contribution was 0.4% of GDP, despite the financial crisis. But we're still well below the 0.51% suggested by the EU. Why can't Germany afford more? We have the strongest economy in Europe. Yes, Germany is the second biggest donor worldwide, with 10.9 billion euros last year. Despite the economic crisis, we've had three record-breaking years in a row. This year will also have an increase. My development ministry budget alone is due to rise to 6.5 billion euros. German and international aid organizations have long been in favor of introducing a financial transaction tax. Opinion polls say three-quarters of the German people support that. Will the government continue to promote the tax? Germany has said that it's ready to implement the tax when it's introduced in all 27 EU member states. The best outcome would be worldwide implementation. Still, we must be clear that this tax will not be paid by the banks but by consumers. It's a sales tax, a tax on earnings that will be passed on to the customer. That's why I'd prefer it if we came up with alternative financial instruments before we bring in a new tax that will be paid by the people. For example, a wider system of guarantees, which we now have for development credits. We can then combine market instruments with tax instruments. That would allow more developed countries such as Chile and India, which at the moment only have access to market instruments, to get financial investment as well. It would also allow us to use tax funds for the poorest countries, which we cannot give credit to, and to improve the help we give them. Will that be a topic at the next G20 summit in Mexico, one that Germany will place on the agenda? We're trying to generate as much international support as possible for the financial transaction tax, the stock exchange tax or whatever you want to call it. That's the only way it can work. But in the end, it will be consumers who foot the bill. Staying with Mexico, it's a strategically important country between North and South America. Germany wants a strategic partnership with Mexico. What does Germany hope to gain from that? Mexico is the link between North and South America. The Mexican economy is well developed. It's a classic emerging economy with many of its own success stories. We would like to see Mexico take on a kind of bridging role towards Latin America. We would like to integrate what the Mexicans have learned during their own development into that process, and we also want to see a better link between the countries of the North and the South. Mexico is grappling with a war on drugs. When President Calderón came into office, he began using the military against the drug cartels. 50,000 people have been killed since then. How can development work in Mexico function against such a background? We have other development partners who have problems with drug cartels. You just have to look at Central America, Guatemala or other countries we cooperate with. We need to create prospects for people so they don't get involved in crime. Of course, we will never completely replace piracy and illegal drug cultivation with legal work practices. But when people don't have any prospects, they are easy prey for illegal organizations. That's why our task must be to create opportunities, sustainable economic development, and give people access to education and professional development, so that they no longer have to rely on illegal activities. You mentioned Central America. Many of the regional leaders there, such as those of Costa Rica and Guatemala, and also the former Mexican president, have repeatedly called for the drug trade to be legalized so that the power of the cartels can be broken. What's Europe's position on that? What do you think about such calls? The German government does not share those views. Personally, I believe that if we were to supply drugs legally to addicts, that would pull the rug out from under the market and reduce drug-related crime. That's why we have introduced pilot projects in certain areas of Germany where heavily addicted people are being supplied with drugs and replacement substances. It's something worth talking about, but it isn't the government's stated policy. 
Nevertheless, it is a fact that more and more drugs are entering Europe from South America via West Africa. Against that background, is it right to leave the producing countries to deal with the drug problem, or should the consumer side be hit with stronger sanctions? It's very important to fight drug abuse from both sides. As long as there is demand, the production and transport of drugs will continue. Both sides are part of the problem. We must make efforts to ensure that the young people in our inner cities do not consume drugs. We must also make sure that the producer countries have access to alternative crops for the farmers who are so dependent on the drug cartels. As development minister, you travel a lot. You were last in Somalia, which has been top of the list of failed states for many years. It provides refuge for the pirates off the Horn of Africa, who are making shipping unsafe. You were just talking about giving people prospects for the future. What prospects do the people there have? I had a chance to talk to the transitional government about what we call traditional forms of aid. We are already working in the secure areas of Somaliland and Puntland. Puntland is the pirate's backyard and is very important in security terms. But we can also use that aid in Mogadishu and in southern Somalia to support projects providing water, housing repair, medical welfare, child aid projects. That will help give people a future again. We want to support the transitional government in following the roadmap that was agreed at the London Conference for a peaceful Somalia. We must win back that country. There are proposals to allow the Atalanta mission to engage targets on the mainland. The mission could then operate up to two kilometers inland. Doesn't that raise the risk that the conflict will spread militarily? On the contrary, you have to fight pirates at sea and on land. We need to make sure they have no safe havens near the coast. We must do all we can to stop these crimes. The expanded Atalanta mission can make a contribution to that and to restoring the transitional government's control over the area. I'd now like to turn to another country. You were the first German minister to visit Burma in almost 30 years. You spoke with President Thein Sein and also with opposition leader Aung San Suu Kyi, who has won a seat in parliament. How do you rate the country's process of opening up to democracy? I'm very happy that after my visit to Burma in February, the European foreign ministers decided to lift sanctions. I also think the US will lift its economic sanctions. That needs to happen for the economy to develop, so people there can see a future for democracy and eventually remove the military regime from power. However, and this is something on which I agree with Aung San Suu Kyi, and it's something she repeated when she met Foreign Minister Guido Westerwelle, and that is that the reform process is not yet irreversible, and it still needs the support of international partners. By lifting sanctions, we have only given a sign that there is a benefit to implementing reforms. That focuses reform in the minds of those who are not yet convinced of its merits and who believe that the military regime must regain its old power. Unfortunately, those people still exist. Lifting sanctions could help kick-start the Burmese economy and many international companies are jostling to enter the country. How can that process be monitored so that human rights are truly respected in the country? That can be done by aiding the process of economic development, firstly by advising the government on how they can construct the legal framework to attract investors. We also have to provide job training. That will be a very important component and it's where we want to become active again.
For a long time, we've been engaging in Burma with civil society and political education foundations and won them as partners for the reform process. We reinforced those relationships during my visit with additional aid that has allowed non-governmental organizations in Burma, not German but Burmese organizations, to be trained so that they can play a watchdog-type role over their own government. It will also give the people back their democratic right to shape politics. You mentioned education and training. That's a central tenet of Germany's development cooperation policy. How important do you think education is as a catalyst for change in Germany's partner countries? Without education, people do not have full control over their own lives in a free society. No dictator in the world can rob someone of what they've learned. So social change can't take place without education. Because when people are able to think analytically about the way their government is treating them, they'll be able to initiate social change. But those with little or no education have no way of understanding what their rulers are doing to them. From the German point of view, how can that be supported in the Arab world, which has seen so much change recently? We already support the North African regions with traditional development cooperation, improving people's prospects there. That means helping to build up water supplies, wastewater disposal and electric grids. But we have also sent what we call transformation teams to the region. Under the umbrella of the Federal Economics Ministry and my ministry, with the aim of helping to set up independent structures which will create jobs. That will not only improve the situation for entrepreneurs, but also help solve the region's most pressing problem, unemployment among young people. That will result in a more confident society that is able to articulate the need for social change to make people's lives more stable. That's why we're doing what we can to make sure the Arab Spring succeeds in the long term. Dirk Nebel, thank you very much.